Part 1. Loss. Lauren held Patrick in her lap, his chin held high to display the scar to his aunt and uncle. It was shaped like a grisly letter S, interrupting his jawline and snaking down his neck. Steffi was yawning. The adults were halfway through a round of Manhattans. Wowee, Uncle Chester said. How many stitches was that? Patrick held up two hands, all fingers, put them down, then flashed them again. Aunt Tally had heard the story, but this was her first time seeing the scar. She went pale. In the living room, the new dog barked and ran to the kitchen. It pained Lauren to see Patrick squirm, to feel his heart race. Her head began to ache. She saw red when she shut her eyes. Steffi, could you take Patrick up to bed? Uh, but you said... Listen to your mother. George stepped in. Steffi led her brother upstairs. Lauren made a big show out of draining her drink, and everyone laughed. Chester played with the new dog. You're a sweet boy, aren't you, Roscoe? He laughed, rubbing the dog's rear. How soon did he get him? Lauren was mixing a new drink. You mean after Jammer did, uh, the, uh... Chester nodded. A couple weeks. Oh, wow. We didn't want Patrick getting, you know, a phobia. George explained. You did the right thing, Tally said, frowning at the puppy. I still miss Jammer, though. I can't believe it. It just came out of nowhere. Out of nowhere, Lauren agreed. Now hold on, George chimed in. That's not entirely true. Lauren started to shake her head. She was having no part of this. What? Tally asked. I'm not the storyteller, George smiled. Fine, but this is the last time, Lauren sighed. She began. So, it's been a few days. Patrick still won't go outside, and I'm like, yeah, of course. Jammer's toys are still out there, her doghouse, and, well, her, you know. Tally didn't follow. Her little dog shits. George smiled. So, I go out there, I grab the shovel, I'm by her doghouse, and... I just freeze. They, um, they aren't so little. There's just piles of it. I thought someone had dug a hole at first. So I start shoveling, whatever, right? And then I see something move. Lauren began to whisper. But it's real, real dark. I can hardly see. So I get a little closer. Closer. And I almost scream. It's not poo! It's worms! Hundreds of dark red little worms! Holy shit! Chester shouted. And then we remember... George prompted. The night before Jammer attacked, we heard her outside growling like crazy. I thought somebody was out there. But it was just Jammer having all these... these... Yeah, the vet said she was in pain for a long time. George rubbed her shoulder. Lauren's head hurt. She leaned on George. Worms! Uncle Chester shouted. Worms made her bite a kid's fucking face off! Tally smacked Chester. Patrick is fine. That's what matters, Lauren sighed. We did what we had to do. Despite herself, Lauren's eyes went misty. If Jammer was still in there, it's what she would have wanted. Tally and Chester slept in Steffi's room, the kids in Patrick's. In the master bedroom, George was already asleep as Lauren read a magazine. Shit! She said, suddenly alert. What's the matter? Is everything okay? George asked. I didn't put the casserole in the fridge. George was already back asleep. Lauren sighed and pulled back the covers. Downstairs, Roscoe was in his crate. The house was quiet. She found the casserole on the stove with a spatula still inside. She pulled out the tinfoil. The crinkle of the metal was oddly loud to her ears like the ring of feedback from a speaker. Her head pulsed and she rubbed her temples. The casserole covered, she opened the fridge door, and the light was overbright like lightning. She covered her eyes with a palm, and behind her eyelids saw only red. Roscoe began to bark. Tch, she said, and suddenly her balance was gone. The casserole dish fell to the floor with a crack, and Lauren fell sideways, snapping her neck on the kitchen island. Blood pooled in her ears. No one found her till morning. In the hospital room, Lauren was the center of a web of tubes and electrodes. Her every bodily function translated to beeps and pumps and milligrams per deciliter. In only three days, Lauren had emaciated quickly. Frizzy strands of her hair had turned white as she slept. 
George stayed with her the first two nights, but by the third, Tally and Chester convinced him to come home. It was the nurse, walking by the room, who caught Lauren awake. She was sitting at her bed, eyes wide open. Mrs. Rasmussen, you're awake, she chirped. The doctors weren't sure she would wake up. The Lauren turned to the sound and looked the nurse in the eyes. She did not respond. How are you feeling? The nurse asked. Lauren drooled. Two hours later, the family was permitted to see the mother. Steffi was old enough to know something was wrong in her mother's glassy, half-lidded eyes, the incomplete way her face set, like between jarring emotions. Patrick was not so observant. Mommy! He shouted and ran to the bedside to hug the unaware woman. George tried to stop him, but Lauren did not seem to mind or even notice. Hi, Lore, Tally said, and the woman's head turned at the name. Tally painfully absorbed the vacancy of her sister's expression. The doctor tapped George on the shoulder. Uh, let's chat. Somewhere private. While the doctor and George walked away, Tally kept watch over Patrick and Steffi. Steffi was silent, staring at the mother who was not her mother. Patrick took more convincing. Scooch over, he said, nestling beside her in the hospital bed. Tally wanted to object, but Lauren did scoot over, letting the child crawl into her lap. In seconds, he found the remote for the TV. With the TV blaring, Steffi on her phone, and Lauren and Patrick together, it wasn't so different than it was at home. Tally took a seat, and seeing her sister's dirty feet poking under the blanket, cried as quietly as she could. Patrick changed the channel to a kids' network, and on screen, a song dooted and clapped while a quirky host directed the kids. Let's make some music, he told a small audience of children. Try clapping your hands. Patrick clapped in his mother's lap. Unbeknownst to anyone else, Patrick watched his mother's hands flicker with life. Now let's snap our fingers. Patrick tried to mime the man on TV, joined by Lauren's clumsy hands. He was right all along, the boy thought. She was just the same as always. The doctor had just given George all the hard facts, or rather, the lack of them. There was no known recovery rate, no conclusions on the nature of the disease or parasite or whatever it was that turned his wife catatonic. They could not predict a course of treatment. Then, from the other room, Patrick screamed. George shook to his feet. Before the doctor could ask what was happening, George was running. When he entered the room, Tally had rescued Patrick from Lauren. Patrick was screaming, clutching at his head, and Steffi was blubbering. George checked on his wife and found her almost motionless, staring at the TV, shaking a fistful of Patrick's bloody hair. Lauren watched the television as her husband shook her by the shoulders. She watched TV as he pled to her unlistening ears. Her eyes absorbed the program as George backed away, as though from a stranger. Lauren kept watching as the host showed the audience how to shake a maraca. Part 2. Instruction If the nurse were to take a cloth to Lauren, she would have found the woman dusty. She had been alone in the room for 15 hours, motionless enough for the floating detritus of the townhouse health center to coat her. But the nurse did not clean her. Instead, she yanked at Lauren's pillow, rattling her head. Up! Do you hear me, Mrs. Rasmussen? You'll get sores! As directed, Lauren rose from her bed, stiff and vacant. Don't just stand there. Move, Missy! Lauren walked out the door, shepherded by the tired nurse. They walked down a hall littered with empty wheelchairs. In one room, an elderly man was being dressed, the door wide open, his irregular penis exposed. Behind a closed door, a woman shouted, They put radar in me! It's in my tubes! Behind the last door, before the recreation room, a hose sprayed loudly, a body thrashed, and louder than all, an orderly chastised. No, Roscoe, no! Bad Roscoe, no! No, 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 no! And then, the sound of an aphasic man in agony. And the flat thunder of slaps on flesh. Lauren entered the recreation room and was told to sit at a table. For the next 20 minutes, she ignored a 500-piece puzzle. Beside her in a gurney, a middle-aged woman, all bones and skin, murmured continuously, clutching a baby doll in her arms with the hair chewed off. A nurse walked up, wheeling an old man. He thrashed around, his hair soaking wet. He was dressed in sweatpants, a faded army tattoo just visible beneath an oversized white t-shirt reading, Shigs in Pit Barbecue. 
the man cried. That's enough, Roscoe. You get exactly what you deserve, you hear me? Exactly what you deserve. She deposited the struggling man at Lauren's table. He would not cease his nonverbal cries. <coughs> what? the nurse shouted. He flailed his half-paralyzed arms. No cookies till lunch, Roscoe, the nurse scolded him. Though the nurse could make no sense of Roscoe's cries, Lauren could. She turned to Roscoe as he cried. She studied his hands, the way the brittle fingers seemed to point, the way his dry lips smacked and pleaded. She rose from her seat. When Lauren came back, she had a cup of water in her hand, which she presented to Roscoe. He mumbled in a faint whine. Lauren knelt in front of the man and lifted the water to his lips. He drank his fill. He seemed to point, sending Lauren for another errand. It was weeks later when George and Steffi buzzed the front door of the health clinic. A nurse approached, entered the code into the keypad, and admitted them inside. We're Lauren Rasmussen's family? George asked. Ah, yes, the nurse confirmed. We were wondering when you'd be coming by. Yeah. George faltered. We've been meaning to, but, um, yeah, well, here we are. Inside the facility, Steffi walked with her nose covered. She prayed the rank smell of spit-up and sterilized accidents did not belong to her mother. They were silent as the nurse guided them down the hall, listening to the nonverbal shouts and dementia cries. When they entered the recreation room and saw Lauren holding hands with a man double her age, they grew, if possible, more silent. Oh yes, that's mean old Roscoe. Well, just... Just Roscoe now. He and Lauren have become quite the pair. George had contemplated when he might move on from his wife. He had not expected her to do it first. Her face was blank, but her hand was tight in the man's quaking fist. Do... do they talk? Steffi said. You know what? They don't have to, the nurse smiled. It's amazing. Roscoe used to be the biggest grouch. He'd hit us, caught him trying to start a fire one time. (laughs) Now he's calmed down. They go on walks. She feeds him. We call her our intern. (laughs) Oh, it's one of those little miracles. Steffi looked to her mother. She waved. Lauren stared through her daughter to the far wall. Steffi held back her tears while George just looked at his shoes. They would cry when they got back to the car. They wouldn't visit again. The nurses laughed when they saw Lauren taking Roscoe on another walk the next week. They liked to call the pair lovebirds, ignoring the ring still on Lauren's finger. They left the two alone. Lauren could take care of both of them. No one saw then, midway down the hall, when Roscoe moaned, looked skyward, and seemed to point his rattling fingers. <coughs> <coughs> He shouted. Lauren, obedient, walked around the corner to the dining hall. She came back with a chair, set it next to Roscoe, and stood on top of it. While Roscoe groaned instruction, Lauren pulled down the top plate of the smoke detector, removed the batteries, and fastened it back in place. Lauren! A nurse called to her. Roscoe, despite his impediments, worked his face into an expression of concern. What had they seen? The nurse paid no attention to Roscoe. They never did. Oh, in turn, it's time for Roscoe's bath. Wheel him to the washroom. Lauren stood outside the washroom, numb and oblivious. Inside the room, the aggressive washer sprayed Roscoe with cold water and slapped the old man's thighs every time he garbled a scream. It was late when he finished. The washer commanded Lauren to wheel Roscoe back to his room, laughing as the obedient intern wheeled her charge away. Whatever happened to her, he hoped it would happen to more of them. She was useful. Back in Roscoe's room, the old man sniffled from his abatement. He pointed to a drawer and groaned in his usual manner. Lauren deciphered it as she did and pulled it open. Inside, there were dozens of batteries. She reached into her sweatpants and deposited the final two. (coughs) Roscoe intoned, and Lauren returned to the man. She knelt before him. He laid his largely inoperable hands on her shoulders and moved them gently. (coughs) He said, eyes moist. Lauren made no expression, but in her dim eyes, Roscoe could tell she understood. The other residents were already in bed, doors closed. 
It was quiet as Lauren walked down the hall, left hand filled with bunched up newspapers, something hidden in her right fist. She passed no nurses, not that they bothered with her anymore. Lauren was harmless. Lauren stopped at the glass doors of the back exit. She pushed on the door, but it would not budge. Next to the door, a metal plaque read, 2668 to exit, above a keypad. She pondered it briefly, then smashed her open palm into the keypad over and over. The plastic case cracked, began to spark and crackle, and she broke a finger. But when she pushed on the door, it opened. Lauren walked around the facility, cold in the night air, until she heard a tap at a window. She turned to the sound and found Roscoe on the other side of the glass. He motioned with his hands, made a sound she didn't need to hear. She wedged the newspaper into an opening in the wooden slats of the building. She opened her right fist. She held a lighter. She attempted to strike a flame and in the process bent her broken finger perpendicular to the other fingers as though it were waving hello. Inside the room, Roscoe watched the dark night grow orange and yellow by his window, his only friend flickering with light. Raising a hand with difficulty, he waved to the woman. She did not wave back. He tilted his head back and waited for the flames. Glass cracked, fire began to roar, but no alarms rang out. Lauren walked down the midnight road. Part 3. Repetition By the time Lauren rounded the familiar bends of her neighborhood street, her feet were bleeding. She did not slow. She did not get lost. It was quiet inside the Rasmussen household. The dog asleep, the family in their beds, the lights off. At the front door came the jiggle of a door handle, which would not turn all the way. A minute later, the patio door handle rattled, which too did not open. Finally, the garage doorknob squeaked and turned fully. Lauren entered the home. She heard the dog barking and followed the sound to a cage. She twisted her head at the dog's cries, then understood. She unlocked the cage. Roscoe stepped out, happy to see the woman again. He followed her mutely. Lauren walked up and down the hallways of the house, with her eyes set on the ceiling. She stopped three times, pulled a chair into each place, and removed the detachable face of each smoke alarm. She pinched the batteries free, difficult now with the broken finger. It was then, her belly, long dormant and constipated, began to rumble. She led the dog to the upstairs bathroom. She passed the closed door of her son, of her husband, and the open door of her daughter. Within, Steffi stirred, and dreamily whispered a word Lauren no longer recognized. Mom? In the bathroom, the dog watched as the woman dropped her sweatpants, squat on the toilet, and wrenched her face in sudden concentration. Her teeth grinded, and she growled in animal pain. Without wiping, she stood up and beheld her deed. Thousands of tiny, dark red worms writhed in the toilet, too much to ever flush. Pants still down, she walked downstairs, opened the front door, and left, the lighter in her hand. Roscoe followed. Out in front of the house, Lauren stood. The dog was at her side, obedient. The house, quiet and still, grew increasingly bright. Lauren's face absorbed the scene, painted orange and yellow, lights flickering in her pupils, the shadows dancing across her brow, along her crow's feet, over her nose, but flat over her stretched lips. She did not frown. She did not smile. A blood-red worm plopped from her shame to the concrete of the driveway. The dog and the woman walked away, made silhouettes by the flames. This story is 